usually my topics are really covering more sort of the high level discussions around cybersecurity. It's not really product related or anything uh, related to that. I've been in this industry for a, a very long time and I've also been able to work with some very interesting people on some very interesting projects. And, and over time, what I've learned to understand is, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is that you know, generally across the board, we're really struggling with uh, cybersecurity and all the things that are going on there. There's lots of organizations being taken down by ransomware and other uh, kind of debilitating, debilitating malware. So <clears throat> what I try to do is to sort of use the presentations that I do in more sort of a um, documentary style format. It's really not talking about technology specifically, <clears throat> but really around the challenges that we have in cybersecurity and also provide some examples of things that are done out there by these cyber criminals and nation states to compromise your networks, despite you know your best efforts to put in the uh, the types of controls that you need to in order to avoid those types of things. <clears throat> One of the things I've added in here is so as a takeaway, really, there's a couple of things that I really really stress, uh, and I've learned this over time is really the idea of building a strategic cybersecurity plan because it really. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter a lot in terms of what technologies you buy. It's really the use of those technologies and how you strategize the use of those technologies as well. Um, I've worked in, in, in various different capacities in the industry. And so uh, my, I've had a kind of a bird's eye view of front row seat for almost uh, 30 years uh, around what happens in this industry. So <clears throat> my name's Ken Muir. Um, I've been around for uh, since 1993, actually, uh, in this business. So I, as I mentioned before, I've had a front row seat to see how this industry has really evolved. <clears throat> there wasn't really a lot uh, going on back then in terms of activity. There wasn't really a lot written about cybersecurity. It really was sort of the Wild West to try to figure out, you know, what the best solutions were for people based on a very limited set of uh, technologies that we had back then. Uh, I was uh, uh, published as a top 100 global thought leader for 2020 only one of two people that were representing Canada. And I also made the who's who list in cybersecurity for 2021 as well. Um, I got my net network engineering certifications back in 1995. I, I learned my hacking skills based in the late 90s. I worked with you know, anywhere from a $200 projects in a mom and pop shop up to uh, uh, multi-million dollar, very large complex implementations for both the uh, 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 US and Canadian governments and uh, uh, I've also built and rebuilt security operation centers. So I know how all this stuff really works from an inside out uh, perspective. I've done packet level analysis to find the bad guys on the wire. Uh, I've built global communication systems as well using what we call SD-WAN nowadays. It wasn't uh, so cool in, uh, in terms of the way we were doing this before, but <clears throat> in terms of the way it was, what it was called. But the, one of the things that uh, I'd learned, you know, my first uh, security operations center that I built was back in 2002. Of course, the very first customer that we had was a $4 billion <coughs> um, retailer that was the largest importer of wines and spirits in the world. And they had 800 locations. So if you think about the fact that people are struggling to even secure one location or even a small handful of locations, the idea of trying to secure uh, an organization that's a $4 billion business um, with 800 locations was a, a real challenge with a very limited uh, set of uh, tools that we had back then. <clears throat> Becoming a global thought leader is not around, it's not about, you know, knowing who has the best firewalls in the market or who has the best endpoint security or any of that stuff. It's really a combination of things that you learn uh, over time and, you know, interests that might converge to give you more of a global view of the way things are. I've been very lucky in my career. I've met a lot of very interesting people. I've done a lot of very interesting projects. Uh, you know, peers that I have uh, become friends of mine are people in a very high level in different uh, countries. And so I've learned from them in terms of what they do uh, to try to uh, help out in reducing the effect that cybersecurity uh, and the impl implications of that uh, that have in the world. One of the areas that most interested me was the history of warfare. I've big reader of things that have happened over the last few thousand years uh, has really helped to shape uh, my understanding of the way we're supposed to be dealing with what we're calling the cyber war uh, right now. I usually like to start off with, you know, my many influences uh, and there are two major influences I had in my career. <clears throat> I read this, the book of uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War back in the mid nineties. 
And it really helped to shape my understanding of um, the way you're supposed to deal with the threats because it's really about challenges. It's not strictly about uh, warfare. This book is actually used across a lot of different industries. I found out that there's a lot of different uh, sports managers actually use this book to develop strategy around how they're going to compete uh, in the sports arena. And it's used across the industry. I also learned uh, years later that it was actually recommended reading at a lot of the uh, colleges and universities. And then there was uh, Kevin Mitnick, if you've never heard of him. He's also known as the world's famous hacker. He applied his trade in the eight, late 80s and early 90s before he was uh, picked up by the FBI and then served several years in prison. Now, prior to that, uh, reading his book, you know, I thought that the hack was a, a technical, uh, purely technical endeavor. But what I learned from reading that book was he actually, uh, he actually perfected the art of social engineering to be able to make people do things that they weren't supposed to. So obviously that rings true for today. We're still experiencing that type of thing. Social engineering is one way to circumvent security. It doesn't take a lot of uh, uh, you know, technical capabilities, but it's a way of evading firewalls and all kinds of technologies uh, in today's world. But he was using this to be able to walk into buildings and steal their, their uh, uh, intellectual property. Uh, he did this for many, many years. Like if you read his books, it's astonishing what he was able to do. So it's usually a call to action at the end of these uh, presentations, but I'm just gonna bring this right up front. <clears throat> because I built and rebuilt security operations centers, one of the things that we've aligned ourselves to today is actually following industry standards. How in our entire operation, it's almost military-like, we followed very strictly uh, um, industry standards. And these standards are globally recognized. They prescribe everything that you're supposed to know, everything that you're supposed to do, and be aware of in terms of what you're supposed to do for cybersecurity. They're really like a, a guidebook to how to be secure. Um, and so when I, so when I say we need to be an expert at what we do, I'm not talking about becoming a cybersecurity expert. What I'm talking about is being an expert at, at the process around managing security. <clears throat> you know, as an example, like I go into an organization, for instance, that's been HIPAA ransomware. And it, in almost every case uh, that I go in there, I found that they haven't patched systems that were vulnerable to uh, you know, ransomware that are probably one or two or three years old. It's that kind of diligence that really needs to be in place to make sure that the investment that you make in technologies are actually working for you. And building proper security plans around that is really gonna help <clears throat> because you know, one of the things I never really hear uh, when I'm talking with customers is they talk about five-year IT plans but never really talk about what their plans are for cybersecurity outside of maybe doing a pen test, uh, which is not really the first thing you're supposed to do anyway, and incorporate best practices in order to build out that, that security uh, strategy. So no presentation would be uh, complete without uh, um, a discussion around ransomware. There used to be this term called the triple threat uh, ransomware attack. I don't really hear it much anymore, but really what it talks about is the three different types of malware that's downloaded as part of the, a ransomware package. The first one is designed to elevate privileges for a hacker. You know, you're going as the, the janitor and the next thing you know, you've elevated your privilege, privileges up to a super admin. And unfortunately in most organizations that I've ever been into, they, all, they almost all had these vulnerabilities where um, they, the hackers can execute code to actually elevate their privileges. Uh, and this is how they're able to download and actually propagate ransomware. Um, the introduction of being able to steal your files was a thing that was added in there, um, and then ultimately uh, encrypting your files. I just wanted to cover off the, the WannaCry thing. I know this is pretty old. I know this happened back in 2017, but it's unfortunately something that keeps repeated over and over and over again. The patch for this was available in February. The actual ransomware when it kicked off was in May. So there was a few months gap between when the patch was available, there was an emergency uh, uh, message that was sent from Microsoft saying that you needed to patch your system straight away. So when I hear companies asking about, you know, which technology is going to protect me from ransomware, well, you, you either own it already or you should own it already. It's just basically your patching system. It, it doesn't really take anything much more sophisticated than that. If you're keeping up with your patches, that is the most important thing. And I really stress that because not everybody can afford to put in every single you know, technology that's available in the market today. 
But if, you follow, if you're following uh, best practices, sort of very, um, you know, just the basic principles around security, you're going to make a big difference in terms of the way you're able to secure your environment. But yet this, this virus here, it actually caused, you know, 200,000 computers to go down. It affected the National Health Service in Britain. Uh, it was one of the most significant uh, effects of that. And it was, you know, ultimately it was really avoidable is the point I'm making. There isn't really a lot, to, you know, talked about in terms of the Canadian experience in terms of cybersecurity. We tend not to uh, disclose too much about the things that happened here. Um, but CDW did a, a study a couple of years ago. And what they found was in combination with uh, Statistics Canada was uh, just over 20% of businesses in this country had been taken down by ransomware. That's a massive number for our community of businesses that equal about 1.3 million. Um, and then you see again, the study pretty much showed the same thing again for 2020. So we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses that have been taken or had some effect uh, with either ransomware or some debilitating uh, malware that affected the production of their businesses. But the most staggering uh, statistic about this was just 80 of those 20%, uh, almost 80% of those businesses were reinfected by ransomware. Uh, and, and I've seen this even for myself, like in customers that I've been into, you know, they call and say, hey, we cleaned up everything, we did a restore, and we got hit again with ransomware. It's because these guys are clever, right? They know that you run daily, weekly, you know, bi-weekly, monthly backups, and they'll sit and wait. They're quite happy to wait. It's not a case where somebody clicks on a link, downloads some ransomware, and, and it kicks off. <clears throat> it just doesn't work like that. It'll sit in your system for three, four weeks before it actually triggers because they know when you do the restores that it will actually reinfect uh, your systems again. And this affected 80% of those 20%. Um, might wanna take a note of this, not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, Interpol actually has a website. It's called No More Ransom. And, uh, and what they're trying to do is collect as many uh, ransomware keys as possible. So in the event that you do happen to get hit with maybe a, a, a ransomware that was a little bit older, the keys potentially are on this website. Obviously, they don't have everything there is available because these things are coming out uh, new all the time. Uh, one of the other things that I've seen uh, we're really struggling with in the industry is the cybersecurity talent crunch. <clears throat> in the early days when I first read this, you know, it, it's pretty staggering to think that maybe there's not enough people that are going through the uh, training that the colleges and the universities are, uh, are offering. But then over time, I started realizing when I started looking at the job ads that were being posted, I was thinking, you know, really what they're asking for is kind of crazy because it almost reads like they're looking for astronauts and they're looking for, you know, fighter pilots and people who have been to Mars and back. Like it's, it's, a, it's a really unrealistic expectation to think that you're going to be able to find people that have all of these experiences that, the, you know, any company would be looking for. Because really, like any IT person, if there's, you know, IT people that are, uh, on uh, this presentation today, anybody can be turned into a security person. Actually, if you have the requisite background, you really just need to get the right training uh, and develop the right mindset and away you go. Uh, I remember hiring a guy a few years ago. He was selling cell phones out of a, a retail store. He now works for one of the biggest cybersecurity companies uh, in Canada as a pen tester, which is a really advanced uh, uh, cybersecurity skill actually, but it really comes down to the fact that, you know, how willing are you to learn this business? And so what I would say to HR departments is you got to really look at what you're trying to do when you're trying to hire people. You have to look at the lowest common denominator and really try to find out whether that, that person, you know, has a real interest in this. They'll learn this, no problem. So where did we come from? I started in 1993, as I told you. Um, it was a very sym symmetrical situation right, right there. You know, we had the good guys on the inside, the bad guys on the outside, firewall in between, and life was good. But we live in a very asymmetrical world right now in terms of cybersecurity. The threats are coming from everywhere. I have examples of, of exactly how this happens uh, later on in the presentation. But this is really what we're, we're faced with. The threats are literally everywhere. Uh, and being able to develop maybe a, a cybersecurity culture as a country, as opposed to just within a single organization is really where we need to get to. It needs to be on top of mind with everybody that's uh, uh, in, in the country, right from, you know, the children on up, they need to really to start developing good security practices from a very early age and everybody needs to really be involved in that. 
I have a lot of quotes that I like to include in these things, but I'm only going to include this one here. It's from Winston Churchill. Uh, it really says that those that fail to learn from history are bound to repeat those things again. And it really speaks to what I was talking about earlier about the ransomware uh, scenario with WannaCry. We keep seeing the same thing over and over again. Um, I'm a voracious reader of cyber. I'm an, I'm an analyst and a researcher in this business uh, as well. And um, for the first time in, I think, 15 years of producing this, this report, the World Economic Forum has actually listed cybersecurity in the clear and debt present danger category. And it actually made it to number four. And if you think about the, the effect that, uh, you know, the cybersecurity in incidents that we're having are having on the economy, as well as the livelihoods of the people working at companies that are affected by these things, as well as the fact that companies are going out of business because of this, it truly is a, a, a real problem. It's affecting our infrastructure. We, uh, you know, we're at risk at so many different areas across the board. That's the reason why it's included in there. And they see this as being a real threat for the next three to five years as well. Uh, Poneman Institute, another uh, publication that comes out on a yearly basis that I also read. There's a hundred thousand things that these guys talk about. So I try to sort of cherry pick the stuff that really makes sense and really are applicable in our world, actually. Um, one of the statistics that they track is what they call the average time to detect and respond to a breach that a corporation has. And for last year, it was around about 280 days. So what that means is that from the time somebody actually breaches your network to the time it's detected and cleaned is 280 days. Now, our pen testers have already shown that we can own your network in a day. So that means that we have 279 days to really do a lot of damage uh, within your network. And that's what we call persistence. And that word actually appears again later in the presentation. But persistence is what these guys do. They land and expand and they will stay in your network as long as they need to, to learn all the things about your network in order for them to perpetrate the acts that they do. National Cybersecurity Alliance, um, what they found from the study that they did was 60% of small to medium sized businesses actually go out of business after a major breach. You know, for the reasons that uh, are listed on here, but what I've seen for myself is you've got small companies that are 10, 15 people, but they've got multi million dollar contracts with, you know, large conglomerate global businesses. <clears throat> you know, if they get breached and they lose data for those companies, you're not really going to survive that because. A, you might be in breach of contract with those companies, but B, the, the credibility that you had with them before is just literally going to be gone. And for a lot of these companies, because they've got, you know, very specific IP or some, you know, wonderful gadget that they were able to use for the, the business that they were doing with these companies, they're in a very niche market. And once they lose that credibility, nobody else is going to trust them. And so, the, the, again, not following industry best practice is the reason why these companies are getting into trouble. Another area that we've seen actually that's growing uh, as a real problem is nation state activity. Um, if you've never heard of the, the uh, uh, term sock puppets, what that means is <clears throat> these nation states and other actors are creating millions of fake accounts on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and the whole idea is to really set up and, and impose like their, their form of propaganda on, on developed societies. Uh, the whole intent is to really interfere with our democracies, they interfere with us individually, and is to put, pit us against each other. That's what they do in this. And they're using, you know, cyber means to be able to do this. You know, as an example, like if you've seen and heard of anybody talking about tracking chips that are in the uh, vaccines that have been put in there, you know, this all comes from uh, uh, misinformation or disinformation that's on these websites. And, and it's a real problem because unfortunately it's working for a lot of the populations. And again, it's another threat to us as well. So the point being is, is that, you know, understanding who has the best firewalls in the marketplace is not, it's really just a small aspect of the overall challenge. I'm just going to bounce through, through these next set of slides real quick, just to kind of give a little bit of a, um, a backstory on what the nation states are doing. If you're not familiar with the concept of advanced persistent threats, um, they're, uh, you know, awkwardly uh, the acronym known as uh, APTs. And these are really strictly around uh, nation states. They have groups within those nations that are either you know, part of the military or they're sponsored by the, the, the government themselves. And they have different functions. Like with North Korea, for instance, I'm most familiar with the Lazarus group uh, right here. They were responsible for the Sony hack. 
but they're also responsible mostly for actually breaking into the banks around the world. And their whole intent is to actually steal money. The stealing of the money is designed to actually pay for their nuclear ambitions. And so that particular group is actually set up for that specific purpose. Uh, in Russia, we've got the Fancy Bear, Cozy Bear, and also the Internet Research Agency. Those are the people that are creating these sock puppets, they're creating fake websites, you know, trying to do whatever they can to provide misinformation and disinformation for a particular country. And it really is a problem. Um, I just read this recently about uh, CrowdStrike actually came out. Uh, what their study was, they found that, you know, these guys were behind 60%, 67% of the state-sponsored attacks. And when you look at the amount of uh, groups that they have working with them, you can see how this correlates uh, right here. These are the people that are actually trying to break into your organizations as government uh, institutions. You're a prime target for these guys. You know, we're familiar with the solar winds that happened earlier on this year. You know, one of the things that I took from this and reading it is that I don't really understand how so many of these organizations were compromised by this malware, which was designed to put in a back door into their uh, and nobody d discovered the fact that the uh, you know these guys were had a presence within the network, and so they again were able to achieve persistence. Um, you know, it was discovered toward the end of last year. One of the reports that I read said it, it, it could have started as early as uh, early 2019. So that was almost like a year and a half into uh, inside these organizations before anybody detected it. Again, a failure in process. We're familiar with also what happened with these guys. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of credential stuffing, but this is a, the, uh, when these guys buy your credentials off the dark web, they put them into a tool which runs across the entire digital domain looking for matches. Unfortunately, what uh, users are tending to do is that they use the same credentials over and over again. So these credentials are in, you know, the same credentials they use at work. They also use at Facebook and Twitter and et cetera, et cetera. And these bad guys, they know this. And so they'll take your credentials, they'll run them across all of the accounts at, uh, on Facebook and everything else. And they'll, they, they found a batch with these guys. So on the one hand, it was sort of a self-inflicted uh, scenario, but on the other side, you know, without multi-factor authentication, there was no way to protect these accounts. Now, of course, you go on the website and it's a wash in, in there. Uh, another area where, you know, you're familiar with is uh, Stuxnet. Uh, that was a, a weaponized malware that was designed to disrupt the centrifuges from building, you know, creating enriched uranium. Um, it was also in, in helping with uh, bringing the Iranians to the table, actually, to negotiate uh, how they uh, actually created uh, uranium and to put some controls around that. And then, of course, there was the colonial pipeline that happened this year, uh, ransomware. It didn't take down the pipelines themselves, but it was the offices that uh, were affected by this. But out of an abundance of caution, they shut down the pipelines until they investigated this. But some reports actually said that they were told that they had issues even two years before. Again, a failure of process. They all have technologies. One thing you might not be aware of is in, in back, I've read about this account of maybe about three times in the last 15 years. Um, I'd read about the fact that the CIA had inserted malware into some control software for pipelines that the, they knew that the Russians were interested in stealing. Uh, and the idea was behind it was as a, uh, designed as a logic bomb. Uh, and it actually did uh, disrupt the pipeline uh, where it was intended to, and it created an explosion, the equivalent of a three kiloton bomb. Now, whether we, you believe that story or not, the point is, is that because you can see failures like that, you know, and based on what we understand about Stuxnet, these are, we're, we're being attacked from all different kinds of uh, areas. And so it's really going to take a concerted effort by, you know, a larger part of the community to come together to really try to understand how we can, you know, inject cybersecurity as a culture right across the board and not just in the domain of a few people. Um, this was an example of how the uh, the North Koreans actually, you know, steal money from a bank. They were the ones that were discovered uh, that actually stole $81 million from the Bank of Bangladesh. They nearly got away with $1 billion, but there were some discrepancies in the way they they've injected themselves into the process. Uh, you know, they made some spelling mistakes and there were some other things that uh, people were able to determine that, you know, these payments weren't real. But again, this is an example of persistence. They get into your network, they learn about your processes around payment, and then they start injecting themselves into that process. Uh, and this event actually happened with the city of Burlington a couple of years ago. 
we don't really know who was behind that. Maybe they do, but um, this was a very similar thing. They lost five hundred thousand uh, dollars. It took them two weeks to figure out that it even happened before law enforcement uh, was brought in. So it literally can happen with anybody. And I know that they were building out their security practices at the time, but this is a very difficult thing to uh, to pick up anyway. Um, I'm going to skip past uh, some of these. I'm just going to jump to these guys here. This is an example of a fish tank controller that was available on the internet. <clears throat> it was something that was exposed uh, and uh, the casino suffered a major catastrophe as a result of being hacked and breached as a result. And it was done through a fish tank. They managed to tunnel their way in from the fish tank into the network and caused a lot of damage in there as well. And then there was these guys. <clears throat> uh, some bright spark decided to take a selfie uh, uploaded that picture to Facebook, not realizing that the pictures at the time were geotagged. And so the insurgents were able to download these pictures uh, and figure out where they were. And they put the information into their mortars and they destroyed four out of the six brand new helicopters that had just been uh, delivered. Now, in our world, where this is really affecting us is that the predators amongst us also figured this out as well. Uh, and this is how they managed to uh, to figure out where their next victims were going to be because they just downloaded these pictures. And if you think about it too, like you could literally plot a person's entire life just from those pictures from Facebook. So you need to make sure that I, I can see nowadays that the geotagging is turned off, but it's something that you definitely need to pay attention to. Um, this is a real thing. Uh, this wireless aerial surveillance platform is a GPS guided, fully uh, AI driven hacking slashing machine. You can park this thing outside of a building. We actually have one of these. We've never used it uh, because we're, we have a, a fully AI driven penetration testing service uh, in the back end. And it literally does everything a human would do uh, when it comes to the kill chain attack uh, methodology. And so you can train a, an AI based engine to be able to do these types of things. This can act as a cell phone tower to intercept all your calls. It can act, you know, have uh, you can set up websites on it, fake websites that people would go to and, and put in their credentials, or they can act as a man in the middle as well to decrypt your uh, uh, SSL communications. And then of course we know about Nortel. Uh, this is an example of a nation state persistence. They were in there for 10 years and basically contributed towards the destruction of that company. I'm going to show you some examples of what it looks like to hack you as an individual. I have an account on this website. It's actually supposed to be used for research, um, but it's basically an entire uh, it's a da an database of an entire listing of corporations and companies and organizations uh, that have things that are advertised on the internet or they're visible to you on the internet. You know, if I run a vulnerability scan on your on your external interfaces or external network. Uh, on the internet, it's going to come back and tell me, you know, what ports you have open, what websites you have, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are listed in there. Nobody's sitting around wondering what, you know, what's IT blueprint up to today. <clears throat> They've already scanned you. They already know what you have available uh, on the internet. And so just to give you an example of the types of things that you can do in there, I just put in the acronym RDP, and it came up with thousands and thousands of entries of RDP connections that are actually exposed to the internet. And in this particular example right here, it's actually showing me the names of the people who have accounts on that VPN. So I've taken away the uh, the last names of all these things, and obviously to protect the innocent. But this is literally what's visible on the internet to these guys, to you. So unless you're actually doing these things on a regular basis to make sure that you're not exposed like this, they can use this information to actually hack your uh, VPNs. There was a, an announcement that came out just, rec just recently about um, the uh, vulnerabilities that were associated with VPNs for one of the major vendors, that uh, uh, firewall vendors, actually. And so this is the reason why these are the types of things that the inf uh, information that these guys can and can get from you in order to hack your environment. So, it, you know, in a case like this, it doesn't really matter how expensive the firewall was that you bought. If you're just exposing your RDP connections to the internet, you're just a really a, a prime target for these guys. And part of my research, you know, I turned on my VPN. I actually plugged in the IP address uh, of that into my uh, remote desktop client. And sure enough, I was able to get access to the, the login prompt. I, I really need to stress here what I'm looking at. 
this is your Active Directory server that's supposed to be on inside of your network is available to anybody on the internet. I now just have to find the right credentials for this and I'm on your, on your uh, network. So all of the practice and all of the stuff that you bought in order to make sure that you're secure is really rendered useless because of this, this type of practice. Again, not following industry best practices. Another example of this, I just typed in the word camera, up came thousands and thousands of internet cameras available on the internet. Um, I just randomly chose a, an IP address. Of course, I masked it for to protect the innocent. Um, I found out which uh, particular web cam it was based on the login page. I looked up on the internet what the default uh, credentials were and boom, I was in. <clears throat> and this is what I was able to see. Now, if I'm a predator, I can actually study your pattern of life. You know, you know I, I learned to understand like, are you a family? Are you a couple? Are you a single person? I then used GeoLookup to figure out where in the world this particular camera was. And then I did a, a virtual tour of the neighborhood looking for the building for this camera. This is, you know, and depending on what I buy as a service next on the dark web, it could be that I'm waiting for you to go out or I could be waiting for you to come home. This guy here, you uh, definitely want to be careful of this uh, little guy here. You may look uh, cuddly and cute and stuff, uh, but he actually really looks like this or something like this. If you're not familiar with the uh, concept of pineapple hacking, <clears throat> this is exactly the reason why you never ever do personal uh, communications to the bank or anything that's personal to you in a public space. <clears throat> this is called a pineapple. And the whole idea with this is it can actually intercept your communications in say a coffee shop or in, or in the airport uh, and decrypt those communications and actually uh, start studying the in the clear data. So if you're putting in usernames and passwords for your bank account, you know, putting in what the two-factor authentication word might be, it's gonna pick up all this stuff. Um, it can even act as a website pretending to be, you know, giving you free access. You know, you go in there thinking it's the free uh, Wi-Fi for a particular organization. <clears throat> you put in your credentials in there, you open up the website, and really what you're doing is activating the communications between you and this device as well. So when you're in a coffee shop, anybody in that coffee shop, they can be carrying one of these in their backpack. And so it's really, really dangerous. It actually can intercept your cell uh, phone calls as well. So you just really be, need to be really careful. If you've ever heard, um, you know, people saying don't do that type of stuff in a in a in a public place, this guy is the reason why. And then there's SIM swapping. This is really is a uh, a problem in itself. If you're using your phone number uh, to do password recovery in, in any of your accounts, my recommendation is to to not do that anymore because. These guys are really clever. For some reason, they're able to dupe these telephone companies into uh, giving them your phone number, pretending that they're you. How they do it is so many new, numerous ways that they're able to do it. They then just go onto a website. They click on, you know, password reset. It sends a nice code for you. Don't tell anybody the code. They're now into your account. And this happens all the time. And once you're in your accounts, this is why you hear pe about people on Facebook, for instance, you know, getting defamed or defaced, uh, you know, people sending uh, erroneous stuff to their friends. This is how they do it in, in some cases. And so I've actually removed all my phone numbers and they're starting to use an authentication app instead. <clears throat> I just wanted to, this is the last thing I wanted to show you, you know, as it relates to the way people hack your, uh, your environments. And we do this thing called dark web monitoring. It's been around for, a, a, you know, a number of years now, but the idea is that we take your domain and we'll plug it into our dark web monitoring system and it will go through the dark web looking for hits on your domain. Um, at, at the very least, what it's going to provide is kind of like the email address for that domain and also an encrypted password right here. But it also can, can include things like, you know, if, if your passport information is in the dark web, your driving license, uh, you know, any number of different types of documents that you might have that may have been stolen in a a particular uh, breach that could have happened, you know, a month ago or even months ago. On the very left-hand side here is usually another column that has the email address, <clears throat> but I've taken that away, obviously, again, to protect the innocent. Uh, and just for kicks, sometimes I'll grab a handful of these um, and, and run this piece of it through a password cracking tool. This is what your password looks like when it's encrypted. This is what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to be protected. It's supposed to be secure. 
I ran it through the password cracking tool. There was about 20 of them in this particular batch. And in about three seconds, I had all the passwords. What I can do with this is I can take that email and that password, go into Office 365, now I'm on your uh, email. I send a phishing email to somebody else in your network <clears throat> in your uh, on your contacts. They click on that link, download a backdoor. Now I'm in your network. I then download all the tools that I need to map your network out. And this is how persistence starts. This is just one example of that. Your firewall wasn't going to help you with that. But be an expert in your processes around the way you look after your, your environment. That's what's going to save you from these things. And this happens all the time, unfortunately. Um, how, you know, how would you like to be woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, listening to a man screaming in your kid's bedroom because your uh, baby monitor was connected to the Internet and had the default credentials on there? This actually happened to a couple. So what we really have across the board, and again, I'm not referring to anybody that's on this uh, presentation right now. It's just generally what we see out there in, in, in the world is we're not really following industry best practice. What we're following is sort of industry best guessing. And this is what's uh, uh, killing us in terms of they're being hacked and breached and ransomware and all these types of things. We've got to get clever with this stuff. Really what we're, uh, one of the things that we're really missing, again, if you take it up to another higher level, is we really need more international cooperation in terms of how we deal with cybersecurity. Right now, what's happening is we're really at the mercy of you know, ourselves. Like we're, we're left alone to really deal with these things on our own as individual organizations. What we really need is more international cooperation to actually put rules in place, kind of like a, an international legal framework as such, to basically say to these you know, nation states that you can be held accountable. Uh, for allowing these criminal groups to do what they do. You know, you need to be saying things like, yeah, hospitals are off limits. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, creating life-saving, uh, um, you know, drugs, you know, those guys are off limits. We need some kind of international cooperation for this because the way we're going right now, even if you're following industry best practices, it's not a silver bullet. But what it's designed to do is to try to put as many obstacles in place to stop uh, these guys from getting access to your, your environments. You're trying to make it as difficult as possible for them because they're really just looking for the, um, you know, the low hanging fruit to be able to get access to these uh, different uh, organizations and different you know, assets that you have. Um, the US actually commissioned this uh, report uh, last year. They put together a task force. It's an 81 page report. It was sent to me by a friend of mine who's the chief data scientist for Mimecast because he heard me complaining about the fact that all we have right now is instead of having a carrot and stick type of scenario where we're rewarding companies or providing incentive for companies to adopt good cybersecurity practices, all we have right now is a stick in terms of finding them into oblivion like they do with GDPR. It's not very useful. It's not very inventive. Um, and, it's, and we need a lot more inventive stuff. This is just like some example of uh, examples of what's in the report. You know, raising a priority for ransomware within the intelligence community, you know, designating it as a national security threat, which it is. It is a national security threat. Um, exerting pressure on nation states that act as safe havens. You know, we went after the Taliban because they were uh, harboring uh, terrorists. This is really no different in that respect because you've got uh, countries that are harboring these cyber criminals and allowing them to do the things that they do. And they're doing it with impunity. Like there are no repercussions for this. That you know we're paying the price uh, over and over. We're either losing businesses or we're losing money. People are losing their jobs. There's, there's a lot of damage that's being done with it, and there's really no repercussions right now. This has to change. So what are we talking about when we talk about you know best practices? These are cybersecurity frameworks. There's like NIST. There's the Center for Internet Security, National Institute of Standards and Technology. There's also the ISO 27000 series. There's things like PCI. These are all examples of uh, industry frameworks that you should be following. It's not telling you what you should buy in terms of technology. That's still uh, entirely up to you in terms of what you do. And it's not saying that you need to follow those things 100% either. The whole idea is to provide you the options of things that you should be aware of so you can make good decisions around what you actually do to manage those technologies and make use of them in the best way possible. <clears throat> and it's done in a hierarchical kind of structure. At the very top of the hierarchy is what they, what they, uh, they, they uh, are these things here, it's called the functions. 
or the major functions. And so identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. These two here are identifying the things that in your environment that the hackers might be interested in. Like what are they after? Well, what are the crown jewels that you have that they might be interested in? And then you put in protections in order to protect those. Now, we're pretty much failing at all of these things uh, in all honesty, uh, but where we're really failing mostly is in the detection and the response piece. We're failing to detect the fact that people are in our networks. When I hear you know, organizations telling me that, you know, we've never been hacked, so we must be good. You don't know whether you've been hacked or not, right? These don't, guys don't show up, you know, as a, with a marching band and one of those really annoying uh, Vuvu sailors and saying, hey, you know, we're here. Like stealth is, is, the, is you know, their bread and butter. This is how they manage to do what they do and they manage to get away with what, to do, what they're doing. We need to have and follow these practices and do better detection and response uh, for these things. This is an example of what we're talking about uh, in terms of you know, the frameworks. These categories here, I'm not gonna go into every single one of these. Some of these you might be familiar with like security awareness training and skills training. What it's really talking about is these are all the areas that you are at risk. These are designed for you to understand if I'm a cyber criminal, what are the areas and things that I should be looking at in your organization to be able to break your defenses? This is designed to teach you. It's a really good education, by the way. Instead of going to an education course, go through an assessment on one of these things and you'll learn tons. And in fact, everybody would learn a lot uh, from going through one of these things. But these are all of the areas that you really need to look at in order to uh, create your defenses, being able to segment your networks, for instance, and do a proper good job of that, making sure you're designing uh, networks on a need to know basis, that you're doing security awareness skills training uh, for everybody in the organization, because it's kind of pointless putting in all this stuff if you're not training everybody to understand where the risks are. That's what the, the whole purpose of this is. And at a high level, it's really a straightforward process. You do an assessment to find out where your gaps are, you roll that into the remediation and develop a proper plan around how you address these gaps. And then eventually that rolls into the management of all these things. And this is where our expertise is, in fact, and how we're helping organizations already is to sort of navigate this, uh, this process. Uh, because it is a real challenge for a lot of organizations, as I've discovered, to be able to figure out, okay, I got all this information about where my gaps are, but what do we do now? And so that's really where our expertise comes in is to be able to guide those things. Um, insurance is going to be another uh, major uh, factor in all of the organization's considerations. You know, insurance companies have taken a real shellacking over the last few years because they really had no idea how to, uh, you know, uh, create the, uh, uh, the premiums that you're supposed to be paying because they had no uh, historical data to really base, base that on. Uh, but they're working towards more um, the idea that I think, and I think where they're going to end up with is you have to have provable security practices in place before you can even get insurance. Uh, and they're even going to go as far as getting an audit done of your environment before they can even decide whether, whether they're going to issue insurance. And so using insurance companies to remove the risk from you to them is not going to be a thing for you in the future anyway. Uh, one area I've done a lot of research in as well as to really to try to understand who are who are all these people like who are all these uh, cyber criminals. Um, I love this graphic because it really describes what the Internet actually is made up of. We live in the top piece of this, which is the 4% of the uh, what we call the world, world Wide Web. Uh, the rest of it really belongs to the deep web and the dark web. And this is where all the criminals live. <clears throat> the, the difference between or the major difference between these two this piece of it of the internet is what we call the indexable range. This is where you can go on a Google and say, you know, show me my pet shop near me. Um, but you can't do that in the dark web. You can't go on there and so, you know, say, show me a drug dealer near me or something like that. You have to know the exact URLs if you want to get to any of the sites that are in there. One of the things about these organizations you may or may not know is that they're actually structured like real organizations that we're familiar with. And so they actually have this, a very similar structure. They have a CEO at the top of the tree, and then it falls down through. Where I've actually uh, highlighted this is where I found of particular interest is that the coding engineers that actually develop the malware actually have a QA department that test that code. So what they do is that they'll actually go and run the malware code against all of the top antivirus vendors in the world to make sure that it cannot be detected. And so they do this as a process, and this is how you end up with the concept of of zero day vulnerabilities because it stuff's already been tested. 
Like they don't just make it, send it out and hope it's going to work. Like this, all this stuff has been tested before it's sent out. And again, if you didn't know this, the whole concept of zero day actually came around in the late 80s. Uh, this gentleman here by the name of Dark Avenger uh, was in Bulgaria. Not sure if anybody really still know who this is. Uh, I read about this in 1994. It was written originally by uh, Norton antivirus, as they were called back then, because uh, I was curious about where all these viruses were coming from, because we were working with so many companies to try and do the cleanup of these viruses on a constant basis. And uh, what I learned to understand was that he actually created this thing called the mutation engine. It's a poly and, and what it would do is it would actually create variations on the original virus. And there was one uh, site that I read where it said it had created over a billion viruses or a billion variations on that same virus. And so the concept of, late, of zero day has been around for decades uh, and it's still a, a thing to this day. Uh, here's an example of one of the websites that you can get to if you, can, if you knew the URL uh, to get to on a dark website. As you can see here, they, they've designed these things to be very simple for somebody to use. They want everybody to, you know, to be able to use these things and become, make it uh, really accessible for you. So if you're uh, anybody's looking for any, you know, early Christmas ideas or trying to getting bored at home because of COVID and thinking of setting up your own little enterprise, this is where you'd go. Uh, where I've highlighted here, because this is also relevant to the presentation as well, <clears throat> if you happen to be on this site, you can buy RDP connections for 350 on this particular site. RDP and B remote desktop protocol. What this is actually saying is, is that they have a listing of remote desktop protocols that are actually exposed to the internet. RDP being, you know, it's supposed to be for if sitting on your laptop, being able to connect to it either through VPN or locally on your network. This is something that's actually available on the internet. And you can go in here and buy uh, RDP connections that are already broken. They already have the credentials for them and just have at it. And a Verizon report a couple of years ago actually noted that 50% of ransomware occurred because of these exposed uh, connections. It wasn't actually people clicking on links at all. So you can see, you know, the correlation between this and what happened last year with COVID, you know, the, the rush to get people productive from home uh, meant, you know, if you didn't have a VPN infrastructure in place, RDP was like your next, next best thing, but you're basically opening it up to the world. One of the other things that these criminals have coming up with, uh, come up with as part of their campaigns now is to actually look for disgruntled employees and actually pay them uh, a piece of the ransomware. And so what they do, they'll send them the uh, the code, uh, which they'll install on their maybe their local machine or some other machine that they have access to, and are now willing to pay out some of that ransom to those people. It's easy to find these disgruntled employees as well. I mean, if you go into glassdoor.com, you know, there's, there's hundreds of these people that are listed there. So they become a very easy target. And, you know, potentially employees that are uh, retiring, maybe looking for a little bit of a, a nest egg to, to go away with. So in summary, when you look at what these guys are capable of doing, like they're really highly organized, they're highly structured, highly motivated, and highly financed. But the most important thing is that they're highly disciplined. You know, this is a lot of things, I'm not, you know, to this audience particularly, but just generally across the board, this is really what I see. You know, I go in and do a, a vulnerability assessment at a company, and I find that they have critical patches that are missing going back 21 years, including those related to rents, uh, WannaCry in 2021. And yet this thing came out in 2017. So that level of diligence is just really not there in a lot of organizations. And it's a really, really simple fix if you're following uh, good security standards. Um, you know, I always had this affinity for reading about uh, warfare. <clears throat> I read this re uh, actually this week, uh, Ray Mabus, you know, he's talking about chief information security officers, how they need to have more of a military type of mindset because we really are in a cyber war uh, of sorts. And, you know, we're, we're up against aggressors who are really trying to uh, disrupt, you know, basically our lives with this uh, working lives, the business lives, you know, even our personal lives and the things that they're doing. Uh, but what really I'm seeing in a lot of cases is, you know, majority of uh, the leaders or the leadership in the country with these big, you know, organizations that really should be paying attention to cybersecurity are really not giving the attention or the, the budgets that are required for these things. Um, <laughs> I thought one of the things I, I, I learned to understand about these guys too is that in our industry, we have to be uh, cognizant and, and aware of like so many different acronyms in our, in our, uh, in our world and our daily lives, both operationally as well as security wise. 
And this is just a an example of one uh, a hundred of you know many hundreds of uh, of uh, acronyms that we need to be able to pay attention to. But there's any really only one acronym that these bad actors are really care about, and it's this one here. And the, and why we while we still try. Uh, to you know, not really give attention and provide the budgets that are required for these things across the board. And I'm talking countrywide, as I'm not picking on anybody specifically. Um, we're always going to uh, be defeated by these guys because they're just so clever in the ways that they do things. But then you have to ask yourself, like, what am I budgeting for? You know, you can't just say oh, I need to buy a bunch of things because I think it's a good idea. You need to have proper strategy. When you're following industry best practice, it actually lays that out for you. Uh, and this is really where our strength and our expertise comes in, is being able to help organizations to build that strategy, you know, doing assessments first and then working out what the budget should be and then prioritizing the way you're supposed to do things. You really need to, to develop a strategic roadmap. I'm not going to go too much into, you know, the, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what the future of cybersecurity could look like. I'm not going to talk too much about artificial intelligence. Everybody knows what that is. You know, there's, um, but one of the things, the areas that I really need to see uh, developing is in the area of deep learning. If you're not familiar with deep learning, <clears throat> it's the next step up from uh, machine learning. This is the, the idea that um, this technology is actually designed to be like a human brain. It's actually to be able to design, to be able to think for itself and adapt and learn on the fly. <clears throat> it's not uh, tied to anything. You know, you teach it to, to perform certain functions and it's able to do that. Our artificial intelligence pen testing uh, solution, for instance, if it goes in and it finds a, a file that has an IP address and a, and a credentials in it, it'll actually pick up that file and try those credentials. It doesn't just say, hey, I found something. It has enough intelligence to be able to figure out, oh, I need to be doing something next here. We really need uh, more of this in our industry because we lack the resources to be able to do these things. But um, anyway, but we need more uh, machine-based uh, assistance to be able to do the things that we normally do, but in a much faster way, in a more comprehensive way as well. Uh, an example of where this deep learning has already been used is in driverless vehicles. That's the technology that's behind the scenes. And if you think about the millions of decisions that a car, when you're driving a car that you have to do in, you know, in the course of your driving career, technology needs to be able to mimic that. And that's why deep learning is going to use that. As long as these eyes don't get a hold of it, I think we should be in good shape. Um, I'm going to bounce through this. Everybody knows about the Internet of Things. I've already talked about how um, you know the Internet of Things, if you're not securing these things properly, can uh, be a benefit and also a curse as well. But there's going to be somewhere north of about 75 billion of these things uh, by the year 2025. Um, we're, we're seeing an age now where we're going from a knock to a sock to a hawk. Uh, I made up the hawk piece because it just seemed like it was appropriate, but everybody's familiar with the concept of a network operating center, security operating center, but now you're going to have human operating centers because a lot of the implants that are going in now, there's a wireless. And so now you can tie those back to a monitoring center that actually monitor the health of people. And so you can imagine, again, if we're not following best practice in there, there's going to be a real challenge to keep those things safe. And the same with uh, smart cities. It's going to be great for us going forward, you know, having all these devices in there that's going to make life so much better for us. But again, it also can be a problem if these are not secured properly. So for the last 12 months, uh, starting about 12 months ago, um, I, I had already developed an interest in cryptocurrency. <clears throat> but what I really started to learn, uh, try to study was, you know, what is blockchain? You know, what is cryptocurrency? What is blockchain? Why are there thousands of crypto coins? Like, what are you supposed to do with all this stuff? The blockchain piece really interested me because as I started to learn more about it, what I realized is that it has a play or could have a play in cybersecurity. I didn't know what, what in, in what areas specifically, but um, and I'll show you an example of where it's actually being used. Um, it, it's, it's quite amazing, actually, I find. Anyway, personally. So I'm not going to go into what blockchain is, you know, from a technical level, only is to say that it actually uh, fills the security gap when it comes to confidentiality, integrity and availability. <clears throat> Those are the three major tenets of cybersecurity. The other thing that it is, is it's immutable, meaning that when you put data onto the blockchain, it can never be altered. That's the reason why it's used in crypto uh, currencies, because 
you know, if, if I'm a company and I generate, you know, a thousand cryptos that I'm going to sell to people, I don't want somebody making their own crypto on my blockchain, right? So it, it has to have that level of, of, uh, of security. It's already encrypted using the strongest encryption. Most organizations don't use encryption because it's very expensive to, to uh, buy the resources for this uh, in order to make that happen. And ironically, uh, because hackers don't care about the fact that you don't have the resources for this, one of the things that I've seen also too is that even if you get the keys after paying the ransom, at ransomware, your uh, <laughs> systems in-house, because they're not designed to deal with encryption, the decryption process can take forever. And so what the, a lot of these companies are ending up doing is that they're having to restore their backup from backups anyway, because they just don't have the time to wait for the decryption to take place. But um, the, the fact that the, you once you put data onto the uh, blockchain, it cannot be altered. That is a really, really important uh, addition or potential addition to how we look at security in the future. And not for today, it's still a very new uh, technology or, or it's a very new uh, concept for a lot of people to kind of wrap their heads around. So it'll be some time before we can even consider that. But then I ran across these guys. I already knew that they were miles ahead of a lot of countries in terms of their digital transformation. In fact, their digital transformation took place back in the early 2000s when they um, became independent from the USSR. Uh, but in around 2007, they suffered a major cyber attack from their neighbors across uh, the border uh, just to the east of them. Um, there was a dispute between them. I won't go into that. You can read all about it yourself. It's a very, I could do an hour just on that on its own. Uh, but it scared them enough that they realized that, you know, they pretty much put all of their government services onto, <clears throat> onto uh, their data centers that every citizen can, can have. But what they needed was something that was more robust from a security potent, uh, uh, perspective. And so they actually built their own blockchain in 2007. That's how long ago these guys actually built that. What they've since done with that uh, build is uh, they created a, a, a citizen's ID, much as similar to the ones that we carry around with us, uh, but it also includes your health information as well. You know, unlike what we experience here, we don't have a health information in the pharmaceutical place, in the doctors, in the walk-in clinic, and you know, up and down the country and everything. <clears throat> your information basically sits on one blockchain uh, and that's it. And anybody can get access to that who needs to have access to that. And the way you do that is through this. So every citizen has one of these, they plug it into a card reader, um, they get access to the information that's in one single place. Uh, and if, if say for instance, you're lying on the side of the road uh, and you need medical attention and you're, you're unconscious, for instance, when the first responders come, they can actually use this card to get access to your uh, health information to help you there and then, as opposed to sort of guessing or trying to figure out you know, what, what, what's appropriate for you based on your health needs. All of this information is already online. It's totally secure because of the blockchain. One of the things I also learned from that is blockchain use is actually ubiquitous. It's not something that's so brand new that nobody's actually using it. This is just 50 use cases where blockchain is, is being used in the industry. One of the uh, more famous uses for this, as I've learned in the industry, is, is uh, Walmart. Walmart actually adopted the use of blockchain and the applications associated with it because they went through a period where a lot of their perishable goods were being returned uh, and it was costing them a lot of money because from the time that this produce was picked to the time it was uh, presented in the store, there was some nefarious goings on where the produce that was picked is not the same produce that ended up in the store. And so they were using blockchain to make sure that uh, from end to end that all of that uh, was secure and it was tracked uh, within the system. And it really changed around their operation. Another, ask, another thing that they do, they have this concept of a digital embassy. And so every single piece of data that they have in their government um, uh, database on their blockchain is actually replicated in a data center that sits in another country. This concept of a data embassy, that was, I mean, I don't think, I don't know anybody else that's do, really doing this. But if the event that they get attacked again, all of their services that would just flip over to whatever they, wherever that David data embassy is in another country. And so by uh, protecting them as well. And in, so in summary for that, what I learned from these guys is that 99% of their government uh, services are online. Uh, that government, if you want to do your taxes, you can do them in less than three minutes. You just basically go into your tax thing. You uh, check to make sure everything's accurate. You click submit and you're done. 
They've had e-loading since 2005, and it's actually saving them around about $700 million a year uh, in terms of their GDP for that. And you can see the equivalents in both the Canada and US. You really need to, to develop a strategic roadmap. It's so, so important for the future of uh, protecting uh, our infrastructure. And you know, every citizen in the country you know, deserves to have their data protected um, and their privacy protected. And this is the way you do it. And that's it.